This week on the Green Left News Podcast, huge rallies to defend the CFMEU, Labor's NDIS bill betrays the disability community, and we talk to Rachel Evans from the Socialist Alliance City of Sydney Council election ticket. And welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name is Isaac Nellis and I'm speaking to you from Gadigal Land in Sydney. And this week I'm uh, uh, again joined by Riley Green. Hi, I'm speaking to you here from uh, Wataknunga Land in Blue Perth. And I'm also joined by Nova on the same land. Hey. Yeah, so it's great to have uh, Nova with us this week. Uh, Nova's a disability activist, a Socialist Alliance member, and involved in a whole bunch of different campaigns over in Borlu, Perth. Um, so it's great to have you. Um, just before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting on stolen land that was never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in our campaigns for justice, land rights, and sovereignty. Um, and it's you know obviously important to all the camp issues that we campaign on is to keep in mind the original um, custodians and owners of this land. Um, I'll also mention before we get started that if you like uh, what we do with Green Left, if you like the podcast, the best way to help us out is to become a Green Left supporter, which you can do at greenleft.org.au forward slash support from $5 a month. So it only takes a couple of minutes to sign up. So, uh, yeah, that makes a massive difference to helping us continue, especially as we don't take any corporate donations or advertising. So we're entirely reliant on our supporters. So that's greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Now, um, to get into our first topic of uh, the episode, there was huge rallies across the country as tens of thousands of trade unionists and supporters took to the streets on August 27 to show their opposition to Labor's new anti-CFMEU um, law. So we've talked a bit about this on the podcast and over the last few weeks, but after the establishment media made these unproven allegations against some CFMEU officials, Labor pretty much rushed to enact special laws that will rep replace all the branches elected um, officials with administrators and pretty much to take over the CFMEU and completely weaken one of the most uh, militant uh, unions in the country. So um, there was massive rallies. The, 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 main, the biggest one would have been in, in Nam or Melbourne when more than 40,000 unionists marched from Victorian Trades Hall to the Fair Work Commission. Um, and these rallies weren't just, you know, construction CFMEU um, members, but they're also supported by a whole bunch of other unions, particularly from the building industry group of unions, which includes CFMEU, the Electrical Trades Union, Australian Manufacturing Workers Union, and the Communications Electrical and Plumbing Union of Australia. And a lot of these workers uh, had actually walked off the job to get to the protest as well. Yeah, here in Perth, there was, um, I saw quite a lot of ETU, quite a lot of AMWU. In fact, there was an AMWU speaker who was quite good. Um, a really a uh, huge variety of unions is um, very good to see. Uh, one of the, the speakers at the Perth rally uh, right at the end pointed this out, which is a point that we've made again and again, which is that, you know, if, if any one of these people in other unions thinks that it's it's just the CFMU that's going to be targeted with this legislation, they're just kidding themselves, right? Like, um, mm. you know, as soon as the co uh, coalition government gets in and gets their hands on this legislation, they're all fucked. So I, it was really good to see that um, union solidarity and that recognition of, you know, literally when one of us is under attack, we're all under attack. Yeah, it's it's a overused phrase, but the, the union line of an attack on one is an attack on all um, really shows why that, that solidarity is needed. And I'm glad that, um, that we are seeing that solidarity both from the wider union movement and from the general public towards towards uh, the CFMEU. Yeah, 100%. I feel like uh, when this first kind of kicked off, when the, these allegations were first uh, published in the um, establishment media um, and Labor kind of started to prepare its attack against the CFMEU, 
it was kind of uh, disappointing to see a lot of the unions staying quiet. Um, obviously, thinking you know this is this will only go so far. That um, there will obviously are some some corruption elements that need to be dealt with, but there's been no proof of that um, so far. And yeah, and I'll point out the um, the same legislation that targets um, the the branches where the corruption has been alleged also targets the WA and ACT branches where mm -hmm. there has been no allegations at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's clearly just, you know, whatever they do find, if, if there's anything at all, is just being used as an excuse to attack a, uh, the, the, the union. The, um, the, the, even the Victorian branch where the allegations have been made, the union took the, um, took the initiative to place their own branch into administration and conduct investigations before this legislation went through. Um, they were taking it seriously, but um, it was an opportunity um, for Labor to uh, to continue to put us in our place, to, to say we're, we're the ones in control, and if you start to get militant, if, you, if your density is too strong, then you're in trouble. Yeah, I think some important points that have been made is that, like, the CFMEU has won uh, really important and actually quite good uh, wage uh, wages for construction workers um, across, you know, various um, uh, kind of positions. And the other really important thing is the safety aspect where they've made construction sites heaps safer, the, the number of deaths has dramatically decreased. Um, and, you know, that all of that is actually a massive risk of like if the CFMEU goes down or is is severely kind of weakened, um, mm. we could see more deaths, more uh, injuries, pay mm. rates will slide mm. back down, um, and it's all this is all been kind of coordinated to, um, from the top. So uh, yeah. it's yeah, absolutely we'll see more deaths. Like that's, as um, as Sam Weiner pointed out earlier, you know this is there is no. Um, no chance that this won't result in more deaths. And and even with the CFMEU in place, um, it's already not a particularly safe industry to be in. There's something like two two deaths every week or something in the construction industry. I'm probably dead wrong on that statistic, but it's it's a lot higher than people would expect. Um, and yeah, and that's with you know that's a massive decrease on what it used to be like 20, 30 years ago. Yeah, um, um, if you follow any any CFMEU unionist, um, their their social feed is always just a a barrage, a, a continuing every other week. This person died on this mine site, and they're holding a vigil year, and there's been a stop work there to because someone lost their hand at this working at this construction site, and it's just it's really sickening to see these people who clearly care so much about their fellow workers and the safety that they have be attacked like this by the media. Yeah, and one of the um, one of the more powerful speeches that I saw actually at, um, at the rally in Perth was the father of a man who had died on a construction site who, and the, the union had helped him through every step of the long ruling court process to actually, you know, go through the, um, the work safe, um, you know, go through the courts mm -hmm. and, you know, um, the how he described the union just helped him personally and there were a lot of stories like that where you know if, if somebody is affected they go out of their way to to help you out and to support you when when someone dies on work site um and you know i, I don't i don't think you'd see any other union do that mm. well yeah it's it's be, it's like the reason that a lot of these deaths happen is because the bosses, the construction companies cut corners to, you know, to make more profits, basically. They don't want to spend money on, you know, all these different safety, uh, important safety uh, features and, and things on, on job sites. And without, you know, a strong union to force the bosses to make these job sites safer mm. um, and say, you know, we're not going to actually, we're not going to work today if, if this isn't uh, dealt with, um, then yeah, as we we're saying, it will lead to more deaths. I just wanted to uh, mention a few of the other big rallies. Um, there was a huge rally in uh, Gadigal, Gadigal country, Sydney. There was about 30,000 
Um, and it was addressed by, you know, the recently sacked CFMEU leadership, Rita Malia and Darren Greenfield. Uh, that was held in front of Parliament House and also heard from the National MUA Secretary Paddy Crumlin and Paul McAleer from the International Transport Workers Federation. Um, and then the one in uh, Maganjin or Brisbane has been described as the biggest union rally since the 1998 uh, MUA Here to Stay May Day Victory Rally. So there's about uh, 10, 15,000 um, people in Brisbane. Uh, there was, I think, uh, was it about roughly... 3,000 or so in, in Borley, Perth um, is what I is the number I heard. And then, yeah, a few hundred in Adelaide, <laughs> even a few hundred in Cairns, which is, you know, not, not, the, not a big city. Uh, they marched to the Labor Senator Nita Green's office. So, you know, hopefully this marks the start of like a bigger campaign of resistance. Like I think um, CFMEU kind of leadership has been waiting to see uh, how bad these attacks are, were going to be. And the, the 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 bill that ended up passing was was far worse than people even expected because Labor conceded to a bunch of amendments that the Liberal Party had had pushed and obviously the Liberal Party wants to destroy unions even more so than than Labor whereas mm -hmm. Labor just wants to have kind of control over them and make them weak Liberal Liberal Party wants to kind of get rid of them uh, entirely as a barrier to profits um, yeah so, and yes. electorally I'll point out as well I mean sure the Liberals want to get rid of um, la labor unions just as much because labor party's control of those unions is what props it up electorally. So there's, yeah. there's those two incentives playing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, labor traditionally gets a lot, quite a lot of uh, donors and, and, and uh, money from unions, but you know, we'll see what happens with that now that they're kind of on the attack. Um, hopefully we can see some of the um, unionists kind of realize that uh, s sticking with labor is not the way to go and um, we can see more of an independent uh, union movement for, uh, mm. built in Australia. Definitely recommend people check out the latest Green Left show. Uh, we're talking to Sue Ball and Sam Wainwright, who are both uh, unionists and uh, national, uh, Socialist Alliance national co-conveners. Um, and we've also put up like tons of photos and videos of the, the big day of action uh, across our YouTube and social media on Green Left. So check those out as well. Yeah, um, and this won't, this won't be the last rally. I can guarantee that. So if you missed this one, you still have a chance. Uh, I reckon get down to the next one whenever it is. Mm. Uh, it's there's nothing like it. I've never seen anything like this. Just a sea of flags and high vis vests. Never, never seen anything like it. Yeah, definitely. And, and bring bring five friends along. Let's make the next ones even bigger. Um, well, to go to our next topic, the NDIS amendment bill passed the Senate on August twenty-two. Um, and the bill has been described as a gut-wrenching betrayal that will cause real harm to the disability community. Mm -hmm. So just a bit of background, the bill was engineered by Bill Shorten and it includes basically $14 billion in funding cuts for NDIS participants um, and a bunch of other really bad things like a debt collection function. It mm -hmm. kind of a, uh, doesn't include any review to th things like the rate of the disability support pension um, and there's also all these recommendations that were made by the Royal Commission into violence, abuse, mm -hmm. neglect, and exploitation of people with disability that were ignored by the bill. So it was just going to make them worse, really. Yes. Well, so so that's uh, why we've brought uh, Nova on to the podcast this uh, week because you've been involved in some uh, disability organising and you've been following this quite closely. Um, so just I guess for people who haven't been following this at all what how would you kind of summarize the the new bill that's just passed mm -hmm. so the bill seeks to significantly restrict what disabled people who can access the scheme are able to spend their money on um, in the long term this will be through the drafting of quote-unquote ndis rules but in, in the interim period it will be restricted to 
a a list that has been published of of NDIS inclusions and exclusions. Um, and this list infamously included uh, the lifestyle product that is uh, tampons, tampons, and and um, not not just tampons, but any any. Um, That's the exclusion list. Uh, yeah, um, and, and often uh, many disabilities, you will require specialized uh, hygiene products um, that will be more expensive in the long run and 100% should should be covered. Um, oh, well, they should be free and, in the first place, but the oh, best yeah. thing is at least, yeah, at least be covered. Yeah, and um, Bill Shorten, um, he was challenged on it in the Senate um, because it was an absolutely ridiculous thing to, to have included on that list. And uh, and and he said it's a mistake. Um, it, it should never have been included there. Of course, I'm on your side. Um, and what that really uh, the the fact that he can acknowledge that this mistake has been made, but can't acknowledge that these mistakes every every item there is going to be a mistake because disability is such a complicated and diverse thing. The the things that that one person needs for support will be completely irrelevant to another participant's life. Um, and, and the idea that you could make, it could make a simple list that doesn't take into account the individual situation that the person finds themselves in uh, is just ridiculous on the face of it. Mm. Um, um, I was just going to mention, like, uh, I think when Labor was elected, quite a lot of people had hope that things were going to get better. Um, you know, we had there was the Royal Commission. Um, there was... Uh, kind of promises that things were going to change, but now we've seen that you know things are not really going to change at least for the better. I think uh, potentially uh, going to get a lot worse. And um, that royal commission, of, like you know, that that was actually quite a good royal commission. It had mm -hmm. um, it had quite a lot of lived experience on its um, on its. I forget what the name of the mm -hmm. higher part of so the, royal, the commission. yeah 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 commissioners or. Um, it made a lot of good recommendations, but Labor, as it always does, cherry picked and chose. You know, we'll accept these and not those. Yeah, the the it cherry picks the 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 recommendations that would save it money rather than cost it money. Mm. And, and even from the the recommendations they have um, accepted, they haven't actually gone on to implement them yet. And and this bill, uh, as we said earlier, goes backwards on a lot of them, including um, the 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 creating the conditions by which disabled people can be subjected to abuse. Um, yeah. It's um kind of become quite clear. I mean, Riley just mentioned it there, like uh, they've picked what things can save money and not what things are going to cost money. And it seems like quite clear now that Bill Shorten was, you know, assigned to this task basically to cut as much cost out of the NDIS as possible. Um, so mm -hmm. as I mentioned at the start, $14 billion taken out um, you know, when billions is being spent on, you know, AUKUS, uh, fossil fuel subsidies. Tax, um, stage three tax cuts. Like, yeah, yeah, stage three tax cuts. So it's like the the place they've decided that we need to trim some budget funding out of is, is the desperately needed disability support, which really mm -hmm. should be uh, massively increased rather than being cut. Yeah, and I'll... I'll um... I'll admit on the podcast, I'm actually a uh, an NDIS recipient myself. Mm. I have been for the last two years. Mm. And this has changed my life in quite a long mm. way, in, in, in a lot of positive ways. And I'm actually, I'm terrified that um, a lot of those, a lot of the things that I've been able to get out of it that have enabled me to participate in this show. Mm. Uh, I, <laughs> I would not be able to do this podcast without the, the supports mm. that make the rest of my life easy enough that I can, I can do stuff like this. Um, yeah. And not to mention all the other activist stuff I do and all that. Uh, mm. So I, I've got a very personal stake in this. Mm. Yeah. Uh, similarly, my partner, um, a while ago, she went to her mother's place and her mother just remarked on how happy you've been. Like. And, and what that has been has been the NDIS. has been finally having the support that she's gone her entire life without receiving. Um, and of course, it's going to make, make a huge difference in the life. Um, it, it's really given our family dignity um, and it's going to be ripped away by by, yeah. by the betrayal of labor. Um, if, if I could loop back around to that, um, working with people on, on drawing attention to the 
to this bill and why it's so bad. Um, I've talked, it's been the disability community, huge strokes. Um, it's not just, you know, a small group of leftists. It's, I've been sitting, sitting in, uh, in calls with, with liberal party members, but, but we've all come together because regardless of what your politics are, you know, that this is going to kill people, this bill, um, and kill people in our community. Um, and and um, I've heard stories from from Labour faithfuls who who said I uh, during the the previous election cycle I went and I stood in the pouring rain handing out how to votes, knowing that if the Liberals got in again they would gut the scheme and then have Labour come and do this this absolute betrayal of our community. It's um, it's really shook a lot of people. Um, of course, you know I I haven't had faith in Labour before. <laughs> for as long as I've been into politics, but um, but for these these people who um, who didn't know who to trust before, they've really learned it the hard way. Yeah, well, it's you know you would take a, a promise, you know you would believe that things are going to get better if you're told um, by you know that they, if if you're promised that they will. Um, I was just going to mention the uh, the fact that. Uh, Shorten held a, a joint press conference with Pauline Hanson mm. um, <laughs> about the this this uh, NDIS amendment bill, and it's pretty clear when your you know your only ally is is one nation that you're on the wrong side of uh, you're on the wrong side of things. So mm. um, it's that's pretty terrible. Um, I was going to ask, do you know much about this uh, the kind of robo debt aspect of the the bill where debts can be raised about against participants um, who have, you know, gotten too much funding for or it's been determined that they've had the, in, the incorrect amount of funding. Um, yeah. How's this going to work? Um, so the bill creates the power for the NDIA to investigate and raise a debt against a participant. Um, this debt can be, uh, when, when you go, for those who are unfamiliar with how the NDIS works, when you get onto the system, you're either self-managed or um, Self-managed, plan-managed, or NDA-managed. Yeah. Um, so if you are under a plan manager, then you talk to them about what supports you need, and then they go out and find it for you and do all of the paperwork. Um, because, of course, that's a huge accessibility burden um, for that's the actually, participants. Sorry, that's actually a support coordinator. A support coordinator, of course. Um, and um, the thing is, the vast majority of support coordinators do exactly what they're supposed to, um, and, uh, and and that job really involves being an advocate for the participant to get the support that they need, um, because you know it's not a matter of the, the, the way the scheme is set up is to give participants the ability to bargain with the government about what supports they can and can't access, rather than it just being I don't know a list of a, of pre-approved things that have nothing to do with um with your personal situation um but but there are definitely uh support coordinators out there who have done the wrong thing and they've gone and applied for funding for things that the participant never asked for or would never receive um and in these cases um the participant will still be saddled with the burden of the debt um, and, and what we've seen, because of course, you know, in obviously fraudulent cases, a debt can already be raised against the participant, um, and and this has happened, and um, often in cases where where people are, are self managed, unfortunately, um, but in these cases, the um, participants have been saddled with twenty thousand dollars worth of debt. Most disabled people are living below the poverty line. Um, and when this happens, that's going to be put a huge burden on your mental health. And we have lost people to suicide as a consequence of NDIS related deaths already. Um, yeah. And what, it's, what, it, what the government has signaled is they're going to start coming after participants. Um, and and that's really, you know, this targeted austerity is going to kill people. It's, it's quite ironic that this is coming from um, Bill Shorten as well, who, who politically traded on uh, and correctly on prosecuting uh, the people who who did do who were responsible for robo debt in the Centrelink system, mm. <laughs> and then he goes and does something arguably worse. Um, and you know we saw with robo debt 
uh, in in Centrelink, there, there were suicides. Mm. Uh, you know, people lost their lives because of that horrific fucking crime, mm. and that, that's what that was. And this is going to be just the same. People are going to lose their lives because guess what? Stress stress yeah. does that to people. Financial mm-hmm. stress. Yeah. It's not just the um, the debt raising powers that are going to cost lives. So, um, I, I had a really heart-wrenching experience where I was in a meeting being like, what are we as a community going to do? And there was a, a participant who was um, quite severely disabled and basically bedridden. And under the old system, people like that lived in institutions where they had 24-hour care, um, but no access to the community or to the things that make life worth living. Um, and, and he described in his meeting in, in gut-wrenching detail uh, but because under under the NDIS he's able to live with his family and have his family and support workers um, that he hires through the NDIS look after him um, it, it's given him dignity and he described in gut-wrenching detail how if he if they come come to him and say we're going to put you in a group home we're going to put you in, 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 in an institution then he's going to go to a cliff and drop off of it and, and he's going to live stream it. And that's what he said. And mm. that was... It's pretty devastating. ...a horrifying thing to hear. Mm. Um, and, you know, when when you're dealing with politics, you're always dealing with things that really hit hard, hit, hard, hit close to home. Um, mm. But it's really hard to just move on in a meeting from, from something like that, you know? Yeah, 100%. Uh- I'll point people to, we recently had a Green Left interview with Senator Jordan Steele-John, um, who's the Greens uh, disability spokesperson um, about this uh, NDIS issue. And, and he made a good point, which is that um, disabled people have given so much of themselves to this the Royal Commission process, to campaigning for, uh, you know, things to be improved. And that's, you know, talking about these like really difficult experiences that people have had um you know talking about how it's really impacts impacts them um and you know having to having to kind of bring up all these various traumas and things that have have happened Mm -hmm. and all of that leading to no real progress is is such a kind of depressing result um to see out of all of this and beyond beyond the royal commission even getting on like you know i mentioned earlier that uh ndos has turned things around for me that was not without significant uh heartache and pushing and mm. hoop jumping i mean the actually getting once you get on the system it, it can be quite good if you know how to how to get on it properly but nobody nobody actually explains how to get on it properly or get the right supports or get what you need and there is such a fucking hassle actually i, I spent years trying to get on the system and get properly funded and that's writing out the same forms again and again and again are advocating for yourself again and again and again mm. and again and a lot of people don't just don't have that in them i was lucky enough that i had that drive to do it but not everybody does mm. um so you know beyond we, we've we've advocated for ourselves in the royal commission we've advocated ourselves personally getting these supports and we're still just being slapped back again and again and again by this government mm, yeah um, the, the government likes to act like, oh, you, you could easily just, if you're an NDIS participant, you could easily go and just say, oh, I want to go to the theme park, so I'm going to pay for that on the NDIS. Uh, it's really not how it works. There, there are people on the current system who are struggling to get basic disability support needs they want, like wheelchairs and um, and noise-cancelling headphones, uh, because they're considered um, either too risky or an everyday item um despite the fact that you know it's quite a significant expense and something that does increase ex- accessibility for the participant um mm. but like yeah there shouldn't be att cases uh, a- sorry aat administrative a- a- appeals tribunal cases um of, of disabled advocates saying mm. i can barely walk so i need a wheelchair <laughs> like that surely that's on the inlet right <laughs> yeah <laughs> and just just on that that inclusion list i mean it, it on the face of it it doesn't make sense to have both an inclusion mm. and an exclusion list 
Like, <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> so, so, so one of the things with this list that really bugged me was that the things that they put on that list were clearly put on that list not as a legitimate effort at trying to provide clarity to the NDIS, um, but instead to try and drum up media headlines. And it's, it's completely bad faith actions on the part of the government at, at the expense of the disabled community. Shameful behavior. Yeah, so um, unless you either of you have anything more to add, I was just going to mention uh, uh, an article we had in Green Left a few months ago about this, uh, this uh, bill by Graham Matthews, who's a disability advocate and a member of Socialist Alliance. He kind of wrapped up the article by saying, that the NDIS is a frustrating, insufficient, and universally indifferent support system for people with disability. He said it's failed its duty to fully deliver on its promise to provide choice and control for people with disability over their lives. Nevertheless, it's the only measure which does provide the disability community with an opportunity and must be defended and extended. And Labor's plan to curtail and restrict NDIS must therefore be resisted. And I think that kind of wraps up... Yeah. Beautifully put by, by Graham there. Um, but I do, just building on that, I do think that um, well, one of the things that, that Bill Shorten said of justifying it, this is that these far left disability troll, online trolls, and greenie supporters have been, um, have been, they, they just want, me, want us to leave the, the system and do nothing to improve it. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I would love to see, for so just one example, for there to be a public option for support workers that doesn't um, that that puts pressure on the private system, drives prices down. Um, but but these sorts of things is not what Elwo is going to implement because it's all about having a market based um, a market based solution to disability care, um, and that was always going to blow out. Um, and um, and it's said many times that that the NDIS is the, the only lifeboat in the ocean. It was never meant to be the only lifeboat in the ocean. But he has gone about sinking that one lifeboat without having put any other lifeboats in the ocean. Um, and that, of course, that's, that's not the way to go about reforming a system like the NDIS. Um, and the, 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 ability, the um, attitude, uh, the attitude Bill Shorten has had towards the disabled community is is completely shocking it's not becoming of of a, a, a public figure let alone the minister for the ndis it's shameful behavior yeah 100 percent. i um i i don't have much more to add on this for this week but i you know i think we should talk about one day on the podcast is you know an alternative future where uh what things could be like if if we uh actually addressed the needs of of people in the community um so I, that's, i'd love that discussion yeah, that's a bit. Of, that'd be a bit, bit more of a positive discussion, I think. Um, whereas this has been a bit uh, dark, but you know, we've got to t talk about what's actually happening. I think to link the the two topics we've talked about today has both been a kind of betrayal from Labor and government uh, against you know CFMU and unionists, and now against uh, the d disability community. And there's obviously a lot more examples of, of that. I mean, not to mention mm -hmm. uh, how uh, Palestinians would be feeling after uh, we're coming up on 11 months of the genocide that's been fully backed and supported by mm -hmm. Labour Party and government. Um, but yes, I thought uh, we could move to our final uh, topic of today. We're joined by Rachel Evans, who is standing for the position of Lord Mayor of the City of Sydney at the upcoming New South Wales local government elections on September 14. Uh, Rachel's a housing and LGBTIQ rights activist and has also been involved in the City of Sydney for Palestine group and Palestine solidarity, uh, solidarity activism more generally. And along with a team of activist candidates, Rachel is running on a people before profit ticket that's campaigning for a livable city with housing justice for all. So welcome to the podcast, Rachel. Hi, thanks for having me, Green Left. And hi to crew in Bullaroo, Perth. Hey, Rachel. Um, so, I guess to start off, housing has become such a big issue in the uh, last few years, housing affordability. Um, how big is the problem in the kind of city of Sydney area and what initiatives are you pushing um, for? Yeah, so housing's lining up to be one of the key issues because Gadigal Country Sydney has extremely expensive rents and housing in general. So it's the second most expensive place to live in the world. Um, so the developers really rule the roost here and 
but we're also home to the Builders Labourers Federation Historic Green Bands. So we've got this real amazing, not too long ago tradition of the construction union really standing up to the developers. And they saved 52 major sites and suburbs across the city and cost the developers something in between of, you know, $3,000 million in profits. So mm -hmm. we've got this really awesome tradition of resident action groups saying um, yes to genuinely affordable housing. Um, and as an eco-socialist, we're also looking at not just more housing because the state government, um, AOP state government and Clover Moore, who's the mayor, current mayor of Sydney's solution is just build high rises. But we want um, beautiful housing and public housing and housing co-ops, 25% of your income on rent kind of co-ops um, that are environmentally sustainable um, and set up for the challenges of the climate catastrophe, which unfortunately is absolutely coming. It's too hot here, it's winter still, but it's, you know, it's hot and blowy and it, it feels like summer. And um, so, so you've, you've already kind of touched on this, but um, these uh, sustainable houses you're talking about, how would they link on more generally with your idea of a livable city? Yeah, that's a good question. Look, actually property investor capital is very powerful in this city, but actually globally very powerful. There's one report that suggests that actually the world's wealth now is tied up, two thirds of the world's wealth is tied up in property, in housing. So, and you really see this um, in the city, city of Sydney, and this is across the board. The major cities have ex extreme amounts of empty apartments, vacant, dwellings. So in the city of Sydney, it is 3,500 in total, but about 400 of them are public housing dwellings, which the state government haven't bothered to fill. And the other ones are private dwellings, which property investors haven't bothered to fill. Um, so what we've got is 400 people homeless every night in the city. So it's really easy maths. You just stick people who are homeless in public housing and then you reinvest and repair and um, and you have beautiful public housing for the more vulnerable but also what we need is a massive public housing build. Now not necessarily a build but actually what we need to do is requisition and and take back these private dwellings which are not being utilized for humanity for the people. So at the moment you've got um, capitalist cities who are designed for profiteering and what we're doing as eco-socialists is demanding actually we need socialist cities, eco-socialist cities um, that are for the people not for the profiteers. So yeah and the other thing I guess all of this it's very interesting looking at the kind of eco-socialist solar punk movement that is happening across the world and it involves these amazing amazing little developments around like the floating gardens in Spain, um, in uh, Mejadin in Colombia they've covered their city in trees um, and 80% of the of the city now is, is green covered and they've reduced the temperatures by two degrees um, and then of course you've got Cuba's solution to the climate catastrophe which is really democratizing um, the, the horror cyclones um, or the democratizing the response rather to the horror cyclones and yeah so there's a whole bunch of of tactics that we can employ if we have control over the urban planning sector um, which mm. at the moment we clearly don't yeah i think there's, there's always a, a pushback from the from the nimbies who who see that you want to have at least some density um in the suburbs of like two-story houses and whatnot um, that they can house more than a single family. Um, that, that they're ugly buildings and that they're, um, e even that they're not ecological because you can't really plant a garden. Um, and of course, you can, um, you can have density and, and ecology in, in the same place. Um, I, I have it etched into my brain this photo that, that came from Cuba of these, uh, this massive housing, um, apartment lot and a, a huge, um, a huge bed of uh, a garden bed that fed everyone in that housing complex through the year. Just absolutely beautiful to say we could have it here in Australia too. 
Totally. That's right. We want massive urban community gardens and we want verge gardens. Mm -hmm. So even in Melbourne, apparently, some, some council in Melbourne, might have even been Melbourne Council, was giving out grants, one and a half, two thousand dollars $2,000 to residents who are doing verge gardens. So there's sort of little things that we can do um, on that kind of scale. But on a massive scale, we actually have to wrest control of urban planning from the developers and their lackeys in council. So our council is totally corrupt and totally undemocratic. Uh, Clovermore just handed over $1.6 billion of ratepayers' money three meetings ago with commercial incompetence, so no one knew where, where the money went. Um, and has hoarded, she, she, they're now at $763 million in the accounts um, and we're the second most expensive place to live in the world. I mean, it's just laughable. And look, one of the things they did do six months ago almost, they declared a trans women's housing co-op and it's the first in the world and we cheered. It was a 13-year-long campaign by that cooperative to, to get the housing, but they haven't put anyone in it yet. It's been six months. Uh, it's just a classic. So, yeah, we've got to fight tooth and nail. And um, and that's the role of socialists on council or even out of council. Um, we've managed to, to push council to be more transparent and um, and push this discussion on resident groups having more control. Yeah. I guess on the topic of um, council, uh, pushing the council from the outside, but also what you can do if you're elected as well, You've been pushing for the city of Sydney and other councils around Sydney to uh, take a stronger stance on Israel's genocide in Gaza. Um, what has happened so far and what would you like to see councils do? Yeah, um, thanks, Isaac. That's um, that's a good question. We So there was a local campaign group that was established almost nine months ago, the City of Sydney for Palestine, and we were really super inspired by Meribet Council, where Sue Bolton, socialist councillor, was really pushing some fantastic motions onto council. So we thought, okay, let's give it a go. We set up a really cool, awesome, little dynamic broad local group with um, Jews Against the Occupation and some 78ers, so some, some queer rights activists as well, older and younger generation crew, and we put a motion to council. And we won a ceasefire motion with what we thought was actually not, not too much of um, an effort. So emailed all the councillors, had a rally outside council, threatened them a little bit, um, did a press release, got some media and boom, we, we won it. And then we went, oh, let's go for a disclose to divest and boycott sanctions motion. So we did that. And um, and again, we were told that no, 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 can't happen, blah, blah, blah. blah. There's a lot of um, horse training and, and kind of watering down um, or hosing down the excitement from activists that something's going to happen. Your motion won't get put till 10 p.m. Boom, it was put at 6.30 p.m. And, um, and passed unanimously. And City of Sydney became the largest council to have passed a disclose motion. And then it inspired all these other little local groups to put their own disclose motions. So Canterbury Bankstown got theirs through. Um, and there's other local groups pushing, pushing, pushing. So yeah, um, you can do a lot even outside council. Um, and the generally councils are dominated by the Labor Party um, across New South Wales. And so, um, you know, that's who we're up against in a majority sense. Mostly councils are dominated by it. But there's independence as well. So um, we've just got to get on and, and up. Now, just the other thing is, though, councils are very undemocratic. And so resident action groups and local campaign groups have just got to feel confident to put the motions or attempt to put the motions and get community support around them and then name and shame councils when they don't pass what we want them to pass. You, I don't know if you want to actually include this question in the podcast, but maybe for my own benefit, if nothing else, you, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned that the council is dominated by the Labor Party. Now that's here in, I'm really familiar with councils here in um, mm. Perth. We don't actually have this kind of phenomenon of councillors belonging to political parties. So could you maybe explain a little bit about that? And um... yeah, good question. Look, I think Western Australian rules are different. So when you run in elections, local council elections, you have to declare your party. So mm -hmm. um, whereas in Western Australia, I don't think your the rules indicate that you don't have to. Um, and so, yeah, you, when you're on the ballot, 
you know, your name is there, Rachel Evans, Socialist Alliance or um, such a Clovermore Independent and so on. So actually the, the people that dominate our council is an, an independent crew. So it's the Clovermore crew. Really they got elected 20 years ago on the basis of the uprising of the queers in 1978. So that's sort of their base um, and – but they have done very little to reinvigorate Oxford Street and the queer culture, um, mm. and they're they're very lacklustre, and um, they need to get out. Mm. Just on this topic of uh, party political parties and council, uh, I believe one of the people who are running in City of Sydney, they were a former Liberal Party councillor, but now they're running under a you know we love Sydney kind of ticket. Um, and that kind of thing does happen quite a lot. I know there's some uh, Labor, former Labor candidates in uh, Western Sydney who are now running as independents because of how much you know people are turning against Labor over um, mm. the Palestine issue. Um, so that's a, another kind of element yeah. of it where people kind of hide their party al affiliations to appear as like, oh, I'm just a I'm just a community member type um, type thing. Whereas yeah. I think um, you know as socialists we are more you know we're proud of our uh, uh, political parties and and the fact that we're representing more than just you know ourselves or more than just um you know as people say like the the roads and rates and rubbish um which obviously important as well but uh council can take on a bigger bigger role mm. yeah. um, i guess on this line of topic i wanted to kind of go to our final question which was um a bit broader of how you see the kind of role of a socialist activist on council generally yeah, that's a great question to end off on. Look, I think actually what we're trying to do is empower the communities to take over council. Um, and that can be, and that's what we've done actually with the Palestine motions. So we have taken people into council to see the Labor Party vote in a pro-genocide way or the Labor Party vote up a motion for the people on Palestine. And when, this is the Inner West Council experience, when the, the Labor Party voted down the disclosed to divest motion, um, the crowd erupted and called shame, shame, shame. In fact, they've done it twice now in the last six months. The people have really hammered Inner West Council. Um, but that's sort of what we want to do. But in that process of um, the communities resisting the pro-corporate profiteering councillors, Labor, Liberal, some of the independents, um, what happens is that we create the alternative people's organising um, units, power units. So um, now a whole bunch of us know each other um, in the both the resident community and the Palestine community campaigners because we're all at the same council meeting and the pro-environment crew voted with the Palestine crew and vice versa. So it's, um, it starts to make the connections between those resisting on a number of fronts. And ultimately, we're going to replace council or um, reform council so that the people can actively participate because actually councils are set up to deflect active participation um, at all costs. And that's because they're set up for in the interests of big business. Mm. Yeah, I just, I just got up, uh, just came back up to Perth after going to a, a, a protest where um, the Albany Council uh, had a special electors meeting to try and ban some books from the, from the library. And um, I would say it'd be bloody brilliant if they had a, a socialist on, on the Albany Council there to, to not just be like, hush, hush, I wish this problem would go away, but I'm on your side, not really doing anything, but to actively provide backing and, and community support would have, been, would have been brilliant. Yeah, we need more socialists on council. So in New South Wales, we don't have a socialist on council, um, but in, yeah, in Victoria, I think it's up to six. So we've got to keep pushing. Um, we're worth our waiting gold. I mean, we do have, we had that amazing mayor. He was the socialist mayor of Leichhardt Council. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a comrade who tells the story because it was his, his grandfather of council meetings going till 3 a.m. Now, obviously <laughs> you'd want a nice sleep after that, but that is actually the aim and objective is to open up these forums so that people who are totally disempowered under capitalism can come in and have their say um, and work out the problems um, themselves, which is really the only way to change the world is that we've got to work out our problems because the ruling class will not. 
Mm. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rach, for giving us some of your time during this busy campaign period. I'll remind people, if you're in New South Wales, local government elections are on September 14. Uh, and if you're in the city of Sydney, definitely check out uh, the Socialist Alliance campaign. Rachel is the Lord Mayoral candidate. We've also got a great team of uh, activist candidates who are also running. Um, One more question. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, when you become Lord Mayor, Rachel, are you going to change the title to Comrade Mayor? <laughs> Great question. Uh, no, we're just going to get rid of the Lord bit, though, because it's a colonial construct. Um, and we're also going to get rid of or replace in some form the colonial statues. So there's lots of there's, there'll be lots of changes for sure, for sure. <laughs> Amazing. Thanks so much, Rach. We'll no worries, see you soon. Comments. Um, well, uh, if people... Uh, that was actually the first of a series that we're going to do over the next few weeks leading into the New South Wales local government elections and the Victorian local government elections, which are uh, just a couple of weeks afterwards, um, where we're going to be talking to some of the socialist candidates uh, um, in, in New South Wales and Victoria. So next week, we're going to be talking to Steve O'Brien, who's uh, running in the Newcastle um, Council, also for mayor. And then in the weeks following, we'll uh, talk to Sue Bolton, who's a long-standing councillor on Marybeck Council, who's running for her fourth term. Uh, and we'll also uh, speak to Sarah Hathaway, who's on Geelong Council and who's also uh, running to uh, go for another term on council. So um, it's going to be a, bit, a little bit of a mini-series on the podcast. We'll uh, obviously continue talking about the, the news and um, the latest developments in all these different areas, but uh, we'll have a, a special uh, council section at the end of each podcast. Um, I also just want to thank Nova for joining us for this week. It's great to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. I, I hope to become regular, a regular I Yes, I hope to. Yeah, we'll definitely have you back. Um, and particularly, you know, we've got a, a kind of a Perth and Sydney uh, bias on the podcast at the moment. So it's good to have, uh, you know, more and more people from, from uh, Perth joining. Um, uh, I'd just like to say before we finish, uh, thanks to Sean Valenzuela who provides the music for this podcast. Um, you can find all of his uh, work at, at Little Archer Beats. Um, and uh, as I mentioned at the start, if you like this podcast, if you like what we do with Green Left, you can make a huge difference helping out by becoming a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. Starts at only $5 a month, so it's not too expensive. Um, and I'd also just say check out the Green Left uh, calendar, which is greenleft.org.au forward slash events to find uh, the upcoming protests and forums and uh, other uh, events. Um, and you can also submit your own events on there by going to the add event uh, option and putting in the details. So check out the Green Left calendar. Um, thanks again for listening. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye.